gas is uh, also clearly clearly on the table but let's be honest it would be even even more challenging uh, than than the oil because it's much more difficult uh, to transport and we see how tight uh, the gas market is that's propaganda it's not reflecting uh, uh, the realities uh, on the ground and declaration of victory would not make peace uh, in Ukraine. These are incredible levels of all. We're holding our cash uh, with both hands, and uh, we still like holding a lot of cash. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Energy embargo. G7 leaders vow to ban Russian oil, but the EU's plans are held up by Hungary. President Putin speaks out at a Victory Day parade, calling the fall conflict with Ukraine inevitable. And complicated and grave, China's exports sp splutter as Premier Li Keqiang warns of a dire employment situation, Beijing and Shanghai tighten COVID curbs. Now, let's check in on the markets. And there's actually quite a lot going on when it comes to European equities. Again, investors rushing to the safety of the U.S. dollar. We're seeing a bit of pressure on the stocks here of 600, down 1%. The stock 600 technology, down 2%. Again, a lot of global stocks are closing in on a bear market. So watch out the repercussion this has on Europe. Uh, the Federal Reserve's aggressive tightening in China's COVID lockdowns worsening. The outlook of the economy is what investors are worried about. I'm looking at Bitcoin, 33,500. And 16, it's getting caught up in this route as there's a flight to safety. And then we're looking at the U.S. dollar index, the Bloomberg one. But really, also, if you look at uh, euro dollar, it's the big one of today as it's still seen as relative safety of the dollar. Now, overall, we need to look at the European map to see the differences between some of the countries. If you look at Germany and France, and this is a, a great way of looking at some of the differentials, for example, between BTPs and German Bunds, I'll ask uh, Mr. Messina of Intesa about that. That's coming up shortly. You can see the FTSE actually down some six tenths of a percent. We're also looking at live pictures of Victory Day over in Russia. We saw some pretty incredible uh, military might that I have to say makes a lot of people uneasy given what's going on at the same time in Ukraine. And now Russian President Vladimir Putin justified his faltering 10-week-old invasion of Ukraine as he compared it to the fight against Nazi Germany as he presided over this annual display of military might on Moscow's Red Square. Again, the campaign of misinformation continues. Putin says Russia's invasion of Ukraine was a preemptive move to ward off Western aggression, that the conflict with Kyiv and NATO was inevitable. NATO countries didn't want to listen to us, and in fact, what happened, they had completely different plans, and we can see it today. And they openly prepared the operation in Donbass and the invasion of our historical lands, including Crimea. Now, the show of Russia's military might comes as leaders of the G7 have pledged to ban the import of Russian oil in response to Putin's war in Ukraine. The EU has struggled to agree on its own ban on Russian oil imports. And joining us for more is our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo. Maria, great to have you on the program today. So the EU still stuck in talks over its energy embargo. What does this mean for the G7's push to end Russian purchases? Yeah, and Francine, in, in many ways, the fact that we don't have a deal today kind of took away the shine from that statement yesterday uh, by the G7 and the White House. A lot of this, of course, was a counter-narrative uh, to this big parade today, just like the big flurry of diplomacy uh, that we saw yesterday, all these high-level trips uh, going to Ukraine. It's the battle of the narratives that we're seeing play out in real time. The fact that we don't have a deal, of course, takes the shine away from it. But Francine, what I hear from uh, some of the European officials that I've spoken with in the past 24 hours is that essentially this is going to happen. The question is on what terms and how quickly. And the tension here is Viktor Orban and Hungary. Yes, European officials, they understand that this is a country that is completely dependent on Russian oil and they need time to adjust. But at the same time, Orban makes this very political. They don't want to hand him uh, concessions either. And it's in that tension between facilitating a deal and not handling too much concessions to Hungary that the delay we see today is taking shape. But the idea is that at one point this week, this will get approved. Maria, thank you so much. Our Europe correspondent there, Maria, today. Now, for more on the markets, let's get straight to Eddie van der Waal from our Markets Live team. Eddie, it's incredible when you look at the kind of relative move to safety mm. that it's just a huge bid for dollar. 
Yeah, absolutely. The dollar is, is, is really acting like the ultimate safe haven here. We're seeing, you know, even, even gold on the back foot as people go into the dollar. And that, of course, puts pressure on things like oil prices and, 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 and on stocks. And, but but it, also, it also feeds back into the U.S. economy, don't forget. And it, it will take some of the sting out of inflation. So what does it mean for what you're looking at this week? And you're looking at a lot of pressure on some of the technology stocks. Is it just markets readjusting? Is it, you know, money being taken off the table? What's yeah, going on? Yeah, you know, we, we're, getting, we're getting a lot of talk here that uh, Europe is heading for a recession, yeah. either a recession or a stagflation. We had an, a Markets Live poll along those lines. Um, and, and, and that obviously ties the European Union's uh, or the ECB's uh, hands in raising rates, which, 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 which puts the, puts the uh, differential, uh, the rates differential in favour of the dollar again. So I think we're seeing more dollar strength, not less here. Um, and that's going to play out across markets. So yes, we are going to see, you know, things like technology companies remain under pressure for the time being. Um, but I think just the wider, you know, growth story takes centre stage at this stage. Um, Eddie, a couple of questions. First of all, how much higher can the dollar go? I know we have a great chart that Valerie put together, but we're also looking at live images, which are just pretty incredible, of Vladimir Putin walking through that Victory Day parade. Absolutely. And you know what? The dollar, again, that story of the ultimate haven is the dollar. The Swiss franc and the dollar could hit parity for the first time since 2019 again. Uh, you know, I, I think, I think um, we've also talked to, to our Markets Live readers, about 400 of them. Uh, about 60% uh, of them told us that we're going to see parity between the euro and the dollar. So I think, you know, I, I don't think that that story has completely been told. But everybody is on the one side of that dollar trade. It's very hard to find a dollar bear at this stage. I'm looking at Bitcoin at 33,000. Are markets in general starting to price in a global recession, Eddie? I think so. And you know what? I think I think we, we le we've learned over the last year or so how to read Bitcoin, haven't we? Bitcoin isn't a risk off asset. It's not. It's not going to protect you from. Uh, higher interest rates is not going to protect you from inflation. It is going to trade with the Nasdaq, and I think that's where it's it's really showing that at the moment. And yes, I think we're seeing a more and more of a retreat in cryptocurrencies as we move through the year if the situation continues. Eddie, thank you so much. Eddie van der Waal there from our Markets Live team. Coming up, counting the cost of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we're joined exclusively by Intesa San Paolo's chief executive, Carlo Messina. It's an exclusive conversation on Italian banks' Russian exposure. We'll also talk about dividends and, of course, strategy going forward. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now we're looking at live pictures of Victory Day. This is in Moscow. A short while ago, we heard uh, Vladimir Putin as he presides over this annual display of military might on the Red Square. We heard Vladimir Putin talk. Uh, he, he was saying that they're facing the task of showing his 10 week old invasion of Ukraine and how that's making progress. That's according to insiders. This year's display includes 11,000 troops and weaponry, including tanks, air defense systems, and nuclear missile launchers. I have to say it's very uncomfortable watching this as we know what exactly is going on in Ukraine. President Putin currently laying the wreath at the tomb of the unknown. You can see live pictures. We'll continue a very close eye on that as you also have a lot of Moscovites being gathered there. Now, European banks are counting the rising cost of Russia's invasion of Ukraine as they brace for a wave of defaults and write down the value of their operations in the country. On Friday, Intesa San Paolo cut its 2022 profit target by about 1 billion euros due to the fallout from the war. Italy's biggest bank warned of further hits if critical energy supplies to Europe were cut. Now we're joined for an exclusive conversation by the Intesa San Paolo chief executive officer. He's Carlo Messina. Mr. Messina, as always, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time. Now, if you take this unknown away of Russia, the bank is healthy, the bank is actually doing quite well, and you've accelerated on a number of metrics. But what will you do with your exposure to Russia? I know you've said you're looking at a couple of things that you could do. Would you actually sell the unit? 
Oh, Racine, uh, I think that uh, the, 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 the operating performance of the bank is really running at the speed of the business plan. Uh, without Russia, we delivered 1.7 billion euros net income that is close to 1.9 billion that UBS delivered. So confirming that we are a wealth management and protection company and we reduce the non-performing loans for an amount of 5 billion euros in five months. So now we are at zero non-performing loans bank, so a Nordic bank looking at risk profile. We reduced by 5 billion euros this amount of non-performing loans in a quarter. Uh, it is clear that we have an exposure to, to Russia. We have today still 3.2 billion euros of cross-border exposure, mainly concentrated in gas, palladium and nickel. Uh, counterparties, and we have uh, a, a bank in Russia that is a small size, so we have a net equity today of 80 million euros in, in this bank still remaining after devaluation. Uh, not easy to, to continue to, to make uh, some, some negotiation with counterparties. We stopped, obviously, yeah. all financing investments, but there are a lot of counterparties that are sanctioned, so not easy to make a deal in terms of, of further reduction. But we are working hard because we think that we absolutely reduce, we need absolutely to reduce the exposure furthermore. So are you considering actually selling the unit? Are you in ongoing talks because of that? Or what are your other options? So the, the, the real point, Francine, it is not easy to, to find counterparties to whom it is possible to make a disposal because the majority of them are under the, the sanctioned scheme. And so uh, the, 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 the time today is to, to negotiate a fine solution. We are lucky in comparison with all the other peers because uh, our exposure in, in the local place is really limited. As I told you, we have a bank that has 600 million euros of loans in comparison with all the yeah. others that have more than, than 10 billion euros. So with a net equity of 80 million euros. Uh, the real point for us is to work for the reduction of the cross-border exposure because that, that's right. uh, the other part of the story. But in any case, uh, as but soon as we will have possibility, we will try to reduce further the exposure. So you, you've lowered your profit target for 2022 given two different floors. When will you know what the best option is given what's happening with Russia and also a, a possible oil embargo? Yes, that, that, that's the other part of the story because the, the run rate for the bank is to deliver 5 billion euros net income above 5 billion euros net income. That was our original outlook. So if the situation uh, for, for something that is absolutely difficult to expect, there could be a recovery in the situation, could improve. We can also deliver 5 billion euros, but uh, continuing the situation as it is, we will deliver above 4 billion euros. In case of uh, some further sanction on gas, palladium yeah. and nickel, we can deliver well above 3 billion euros. This is something that I think it is really transparent towards investors, uh, but it is reality for today. I'm convinced that for June, we will, we will be in a position to give a, a clear outlook that could be confirmed by the end of the year. Okay, June is something that we'll watch out for. That's only a couple of weeks away. Talk to me, Carla, a little bit about CET1, uh, how you see this developing going forward. I mean, you had, you know, not issues, but you've had, of course, a, a lower CET1 like many banks, of course, in the sector. D does it hurt at all your uh, wanting to give back to shareholders at all? So, well, Francine, you have to consider that that common equity tier one ratio is linked to the unexpected losses of a bank, so to the risk of a bank. Okay. And in this quarter, we have we have reduced non-performing loans to zero MPL. So, looking at non-performing loans, we have zero risk. If you look at level two, level two assets, we have zero risk. If you look at level three, we have zero risk. So, our capital position and our capital target that is. Uh, uh, above 12 percent uh, fully loaded uh, is something that is more than confirmed by, by our risk profile. Also adding all the rush exposure, we will remain with mm -hmm. uh, close to zero non-performing loans. So we have a, a capital position that is well above our risk profile. So I'm convinced that if we receive the approval from the ECB, we will be in a position 
to confirm and to perform the share buyback and uh, to maintain the 70% payout ratio on our net income generation during uh, 2022. Then, uh, if I can add, uh, for the time moving uh, after 2023, when we will have for sure an increase in interest rate, our sensitivity is that uh, for an increase of 50 basis points, so moving from uh, minus 50 to zero Euribor, we will have an increase yeah. of 100 million euros of net interest income. So we are for sure in, in a condition to have much better profitability started, starting from 2023 than the comparison so, Carl, in pre-Russia environment. So you, you've definitely had one of the most generous dividend policies amongst European banks. Is it your expectation that this would continue or is that your wish? Absolutely. This will, be con this will continue. You, you know that, that uh, I've been confirmed uh, as CEO just, uh, just one month ago, and my position is that uh, I will continue to, to deliver significant remuneration to my shareholders because the risk profile of the group is so limited and the opportunity to make acquisition are today zero that uh, mm -hmm. it, is, it is not in the interest of the, of the investor to have uh, uh, excess capital that comparing the risk profile of the group could be absolutely useless. That, that's my position. But, uh, given, yeah, and given some of these valuations, as you say, are, are so depressed, what does that mean for possible M&A targets? No, that, that's another good point, Francine, because it, it is true that uh, if you want to move into, into something that could be uh, an M&A strategy, this could be a time looking at the, at the implied valuation of a lot of peers uh, in, in Europe. Uh, the, 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 the reality is that we will create much more value working within the organization because uh, also in, in wealth management and protection, apart from performance fee and this will depend by market we have such an amount of, of new money that we can create that this could be the main strategy the other point let me say is the technological transformation of Inter San Paolo because yeah. we are investing a lot in, in easy bank that is our digital bank but it is not only for the digital bank but to transform Inter San Paolo into a tech company so we we will move the, the IT system that we are that we are developing yeah with both machine into Inter San Paolo, and this will bring us into, starting from 2023, into something different compared with other banks. Uh, Mr. Messina, we're just looking at live pictures as well of the Russian President Vladimir Putin laying wreaths on the tomb of the unknown soldier in Moscow as a country marks Victory Day. So we're following a very close eye, of course, on what's happening in Moscow. And we know it's extremely difficult for a bank to try and extrapolate or to actually in disentangle themselves with their operations. You had a head of Russia that was very close to, of course, Mr. Putin and the head there. Have they had any contacts? Are you still, is he still in touch with the government? So the, 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 the bank is, is not in contact with the, with the government. I was shocked by, by the, the, the invasion in, in Ukraine. You know that we have a, a, a company, a bank working in, in, in Ukraine and the, 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 the disruption and the, 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 all the photo, photos that our colleagues sent us with them, with Kalashnikov, uh, fighting for, for their freedom. And, and our, 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 we started helping them and asking them to come in Italy. And we had 300 of these Ukraine colleagues that we are now uh, having in Italy to help them. And the other 500 decided to remain there to fight. We decided to give 10 million euros to Ukrainian people. So we are now really close to, to Ukrainian people. And it is unbelievable what's happening there. And, and it's really a tragedy. And I'm really shocked from, from there, from there, for what's happening. So I think that uh, it is difficult to make a, a, a forecast today. What we need yeah. absolutely is to force uh, Russia to, to close uh, uh, this, this war because it is, it is absolutely a humanitarian tragedy. And also, and also, if you think on what can happen on, on food and uh, for, for the other very, very weak country in the world, so, so without having possibility to have uh, food because Ukraine is, is one of the most important parts of the world in order to, to, give, uh, to give food to all the world. So it, it's really an unbelievable tragedy. 
Mr. Messina, thank you so much, as always, for your insight. Carlo Messina, they're the chief executive officer of Intesa San Paolo. Coming up, Boli Clear Lake's bid for Chelsea Football Club is firmly in the back of the net. So we have more on that next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now we'll have plenty more, of course, on the markets. Uh, there's a clear rotation or certainly a pause for breath for a lot of these markets that are wondering exactly where we end up with because of Fed policy and what uh, China's growth or the lack of growth means for the global portfolio. It's very clear that uh, global stocks sliding ever closer to a bear market and investors rushing to the safety of the U.S. dollar. Coming up, Russian oil exporters seeing their market gradually diminish as the G7 leaders commit to a ban. We'll discuss the market impact next. This is Bloomberg. Embargo G7 leaders vowed to ban Russian oil, but the EU's plans are held up by Hungary. President Putin speaks out at a Victory Day parade, calling the conflict with Ukraine inevitable. And complicated and grave, China's exports sputter as Premier Li Keqiang warns of a dire unemployment situation. Beijing and Shanghai tighten COVID curbs. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. In the UK, the Northern Ireland Secretary is set to meet the leaders of the region's political parties today to encourage them to restore government after last week's election. A Nationalist Party came top of the poll for the first time, marking a significant shift in the region's balance of power. Sinn Féin, whose ultimate goal is to unite Northern Ireland with the Republic of Ireland, intends to nominate its Northern leader as the region's first minister. On the EU side, Vice President Maros Sefcovic said he hopes the UK will focus on the smooth implementation of the Brexit deal. Well, of course, we would need this, uh, also the uh, leadership and uh, dedication from the, from the UK government uh, that uh, they would respect uh, the, the agreement they signed up to. We've been negotiating them for many years. Uh, they've been ratified and approved uh, by the current uh, UK government, by the, by the parliament. Now, John Lee has been named Hong Kong's next chief executive in a rubber-stamped election on Sunday. After his victory, he vowed to strengthen national security and accelerate the city's integration with mainland China. He said his new job calls for accountability to both Beijing and also Hong Kong. And voters are going to the polls in the Philippines for an election that could see the only son of the late dictator, Ferdinand Marcos, take the presidency more than three decades after his father was ousted. Former Senator Ferdinand Bongbong Marcus led opinion surveys by double digits ahead of today's election day. His main opponent, Vice President Lenny Robredu, has held some of the biggest pre-election rallies in decades as she looks to pull off an upset in the country. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. Countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, risk assets fragile this morning after last week's whipsawing European stocks joining the global equity round as investors rushing to the safety of the U.S. dollar. Now, as part of the latest M Live Pulse survey, we also asked some of our guests about the risk in a global, well, actually, in a recession in Europe. UK GDP growth is expected to slow sharply. The impact of energy on the European economy will be substantial. The proximity to, to the war is part of the, the challenge here. It does look like the, the recession risk is, is very high. There is a good probability for that. So if I have to really guess, I would say 50-50, you know, but th there is no uh, a model with a track record that will, that, will, that will tell you that each recession is different. If Ukraine gets worse, I would assume that Europe's going to go to a recession. It may take a couple of quarters 
numbers, but I would assume that. I think that we, we're pretty close to recession through this year. I think we are all uh, concerned around the globe about uh, the economy. We, on balance, think you probably avoid recession, but it's pretty close. Our central scenario, the central scenario of Economist, is more a soft landing of the GDP than a recession. I'm confident that there will not be any kind of recession, and even not uh, stagflation, because uh, there is such a strong economy. Now, we're joined by Andrew Sheets. He's the Chief Cross Asset Strategist at Morgan Stanley. Andrew, always great to speak to you. So thank you so much for coming in. Now, I'll talk to you about the fading rally and the possible bear market globally. But what's happening to dollar? Does it go ever higher? Yeah, so good morning. Look, the dollar is uh, in a really interesting place, but I think it's also kind of a simple place. You know, you have a market where investors are looking for defense. They're looking for diversification. Obviously, bonds are struggling to provide that in the same way. The dollar is a positive carry diversifying asset that makes it more attractive. And then I think if we compare the dollar to other major currencies, other major economies, China's clearly struggling with the zero COVID policy. Europe has this major uncertainty around uh, energy security that's hanging over it. The UK is dealing with, with major uncertainties around its economy, energy security, um, you know, weak growth. And if you look at some of the emerging markets, they are even more impacted by some of these inflationary pressures. So the dollar is also, I think, winning a little bit by process of default here, process of elimination. And even though it is expensive, I, I think we hesitate to kind of extrapolate the strength out too far. You know, for the moment, the more kind of systematic signals that we run are, are, are saying that the dollar strength can continue in the, in the near term. So, Andrew, what does that mean for where you want to be fully invested in? So this would reprice commodities and a lot of currency pairs across the world as well. Yeah, thanks, Francine. So I think the first case is I think we, we don't want to be fully invested. I think this is an environment to be running lower exposure, I think especially given how expensive it is to hedge, given how high volatility is, how expensive it is to hedge portfolios through options markets. I think the commodity space can still outperform, but we think that's really an energy story. We think oil is, is really unique here in terms of both how tight that market is I think it's well suited as, as a potential hedge to some of the risk scenarios we discussed. And then investors are paid very well to hold oil given how backward its curve is. Now, metals are different. You know, something like gold is exp negatively exposed to a strong dollar, higher real rates, exactly what we've seen. Um, industrial metals are more exposed if there's a slowing of the global economy. So we think commodities outperform, but it's really an energy outperformance story within that. So, Andrew, where's your, is there anything that you would change right now? Do you think that there's a global recession coming, or is it just that markets seem to, you know, start thinking about it, if not pricing it in? So, look, I think it's a really interesting case that markets lead the economy. And, and so, you know, I think if we look at a lot of market price action, you know, year to date, it is trading with a real late cycle flavor. You know, defensive equities are outperforming more cyclical equities. Credit spreads are widening, the dollar's strengthening, you know, as the Fed is tightening, volatility is going up. So so first is I think we want to respect those late cycle signals. And you know, for us, the the, the recent change we've made, we, we had been down in quality and credit. Our, our credit strategists had been preferring high yield over investment grade as more of a kind of a duration short view. But as these growth risks increase, we really want to turn that around. We now see high yield is a lot less attractive than investment grade. And we do think that we'll see more decompression there, that high yield is you know, uniquely poorly positioned in that if, if the economy is OK, the, the upside to high yield is limited. If there is a recession, it's an asset class that is exposed to that sort of scenario. I mean, this it, it, global recession, I imagine, but is Europe, is it inevitable that it will, you know, even if it takes a couple of quarters, will end up in a recession given the proximity to Russia? No, I, I don't, don't think it's inevitable. I think that the real challenge with Europe, and I think we're seeing this in the way the currencies trade, is there's just high uncertainty. It's, it's almost a, a binary risk around energy security and under our economic modeling. You know, if, if, if there's a gas cutoff, kind of a severe energy cutoff scenario, the risk of recession is high. If there's not that gas cut off, the risk of recession is a lot lower. So it's, it's so it's very binary. Now I think investors they don't like binary situations. They're very hard to invest in. They're very hard to risk manage. 
it's very hard to, to feel like you have an investment edge um, with this type of question. So I think that's keeping more investors on the sideline and probably, you know, in the, the view of our FX strategy is kind of leads to some downside in the Euro European currencies in the near term. But, you know, medium term, there's clearly, I think, uh, you know, scenarios where you're kind of in a recession and the fiscal pulse impulse there is also a lot better. Thank you so much, Andrew Sheets there, Chief Cross Asset Strategist at Morgan Stanley, stays with us and we'll talk also a little bit about the emerging markets. Now coming up, as central banks move to rate in inflation, the risks of an economic pullback appear to be increasing. We continue our conversation with Andrew Sheets. That's coming up next and this is Bloomberg. I think the Fed's actions were reasonable up through the middle of the summer, through the summer of 2021. I do think that by uh, September, it was becoming clear that this was not uh, primarily a supply chain disruption-driven inflation. It was a, a uh, overstimulated demand-driven uh, inflation, um, and that that uh, you know at that point, you know, in hindsight, uh, I think it would have served the Fed well to to move in September. Very difficult to determine that, you know, at that point. Uh, but I think in hindsight, that's when we should have moved. Absolutely essential that the Fed regain credibility. It will not do so until it does what the ECB did last week, which tell us why the inflation forecasts were so wrong for so long and how have you improved inflation methodology. Unless it does that and come out honest, it's not going to be able to restore its credibility and it's going to find more and more people very close to the Fed stepping away from the Fed. Some voices there on the Fed. Now let's get back to Andrew Sheets, Chief Cross Asset Strategist at Morgan Stanley. Andrew, what did you hear from the Fed? Because there was, at least in some parts of the markets, a worry that actually by taking 75 basis points off the table, there's too much dependency between some of these central banks and markets. Yeah, thanks. So, so look, I mean, I think the Fed is still in, in a very difficult window of the data where you know, inflation is very likely to come down. That's what we're forecasting. That's what the Fed is forecasting. I think there's some really good kind of simple arithmetic reasons why, you know, headline and core CPI in the U.S. is going to peak, you know, is, has peaked and is going to decline in, in the coming months. But it hasn't happened yet. And so it's still very difficult, I think, for the Fed to sound, to, to balance any sort of dovishness or to sound anything other than hawkish when the inflation data is still high and it's still been rising on the latest data point. So I think what we heard from the Fed was trying to provide some guidance, try to say, look, we are going to keep hiking rates at a 50 basis point pace for the next several meetings, which is a little bit more than we expected, but we're not trying to necessarily do something as dramatic as a 75. But I think that incoming inflation data is going to be really important both for how much flexibility the Fed has and also this question of credibility because these peaks of inflation have felt possible in prior months as well. So, Andrew, given what you've just said, what does a policy mistake look like? Well, so I think interestingly, I think a policy mistake would be inflation break even rates moving up even as the Fed is, is tightening. So that'd be the, the, the market thinking, look, there's, there's more and more action happening from the Federal Reserve, but actually we think longer run inflation is gonna be higher and higher. Now that's not what's been happening. Inflation break even rates have been declining. They've been declining in, in the US, they've been declining in the Eurozone. So I think at that level, that is good news. You know, I think again, the market's narrative is very much focused on inflation, but the market's pricing is actually saying the inflation risks and the inflation uncertainty is easing. And I, I, so I think a, a lack of credibility would be a different response. I don't think that's what we're seeing right now. Andrew, what's the, the best play right now in emerging markets, if anything? So I know some of, you know some of these markets have had to go through huge structural reforms, but they're also so interdependent from what Fed does. Sure. So, so again, I think that we have a, a challenging backdrop for emerging markets. I think we need to look at markets that have higher higher risk premiums. You know, we do think that some of the the local rate markets have priced in between you know high yields and steep curves have priced in more risk premium. A market like South Africa is one that our emerging market strategists like. Um, you know, I think we do think there's generally more risk premium in emerging market currencies and emerging market local rates than there is on the equity side. 
Uh, I think you've seen, um, I think on the equity side, it's a lot more difficult given you know, some of these some of these markets have very, very high local rates, so the equities don't look as cheap relative to bonds. And in other major emerging market equity markets, I think you just have still major regulatory political uncertainty. So I think in terms yeah. of where to venture in and taking risk, we see better risk reward. We see more upside to our forecasts on the, the emerging market debt side. But at the moment, you know, we, we have an equal weight recommendation there. Um, Andrew, overall, where are we actually? I mean, I know where you think we're in the cycle, but why is it so difficult for strategists and economists to agree on where we are in the economic cycle? So, you know, I think it's a combination of just major uncertainty. I think usually when the data is doing what it's doing, this is a part where things can get very divergent. And you can see a you have a 1994 to 95 scenario where it was a mid-cycle slowdown. You can get something that looks very, you know, you can get something that looks very different and very dramatic. So I think the challenge is, is that when the yield curve is this flat, when unemployment is this low, that the distribution of outcomes around the economy have historically been very, very wide. And, and you know, it's been very difficult to, to forecast recession. So I think markets are, I think, correctly pricing in higher odds of a recession, even if a recession is not necessarily the most likely case. Andrew, thank you so much, as always, for your insight. Andrew Sheets, their chief cross-asset strategist at Morgan Stanley. Now, coming up, Vladimir Putin calls a conflict with Ukraine inevitable as Russians mark World War II Victory Day. We speak with Elizabeth Braw from the American Enterprise Institute. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Vladimir Putin has said Russia's invasion of Ukraine was a preemptive move to ward off Western aggression and that the conflict with Kyiv and NATO was inevitable. While well, Russia's president made the comments at Victory Day celebrations in Moscow, the country's most important holiday, marking the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany in 1945. NATO countries didn't want to listen to us, and in fact, what happened, they had completely different plans, and we can see it today. And they openly prepared the operation in Donbass and the invasion of our historical lands, including Crimea. Well, we're joined by Elizabeth Bra, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for joining us. What did you make of that very short speech? I guess it's it's extremely tricky for the moment uh, for Russia and Vladimir Putin to claim any victory, but does that make him more dangerous? Yes, as you say, Francine, it was a very short speech. And, and this, we have to remember, is uh, a day where Russia uh, celebrates its victory over Nazi Germany. So they do have something to celebrate this year, as they've had for every year since the end of World War II. But um, we all thought that, that Putin would want to, uh, to have something else to celebrate on this particular victory day, which was victory over Ukraine, uh, if, if not uh, having, having taken all that territory, at least some territory, and he doesn't have anything to show. So uh, it's, it's, it's not really surprising that he didn't say a lot, because what can you say in this situation? So what does that mean for his aggression in Ukraine? Will it become more bloody? Do we have any insight on what he wants to do next? It seems obvious that, that Russia is focusing on, on uh, the eastern part of Ukraine, and specifically that strip of land that goes down uh, along the border all the way down to Mariupol and, and then connecting to Crimea. If he does, if the Russians do manage to to capture that strip of land, that land corridor, uh, all the way down to uh, to the sea, um, and not just uh, manage to capture it, but to keep it, then they can claim some sort of, of victory, and they can uh, they can then declare that they have won and withdraw 
from uh, any other parts of Ukraine where there are any remaining soldiers. But short of that, it, it would be a, a disaster for Russia. What's the point of waging a war if you don't even win a little bit of land? Of course, Ukraine uh, wants to keep all its land. So it's uh, it, this is not going to, to end anytime soon because both sides have an interest in, in, in keeping yeah. territory. And, and of course, Ukraine uh, does have uh, the moral uh, and, and ethical point that it, it uh, this is Ukrainian territory. It should belong to Ukraine. Um, Elizabeth, what does this mean for actually what the Russian people are living through at the moment? So the Russian president also justified this terrible and bloody war as he compared it to the fight against the Nazis in 1945. Of course, we have to remember that that uh, the Russian population, the public, is is indoctrinated by propaganda that has been spread on on Russian television now for many many years. Um, so we shouldn't expect them to to um, assess the situation. Um, uh, in any sort of uh, normal way or in any sort of neutral way because they have been fed all this propaganda. But nevertheless, uh, the, there is a huge difference between uh, World War II and this war, which is that in World War II, uh, Russia or so the Soviet Union, was, as it was then, was attacked by the Nazis. And this time around, uh, the Ukrainians have attacked nobody. Of course, the, the Russians have been uh, making a uh, false allegation of, of Ukrainian atrocities in the Donbass and, and, and elsewhere, but that has not been uh, confirmed by any sort of in, uh, um, international authorities. Uh, but that seems to be um, a, a deliberate move by the Russians to get the public, the Russian authorities, to get the Russian public fired up about yeah. this war and get them to support this war. But uh, the, the point is that the war is being carried out in Ukraine, whereas World War II was being carried out on their own homeland, uh, which is now Russia, but, Elizabeth, this was then Soviet, it, the Soviet Union. I mean, is it working? Does Vladimir Putin still enjoy the support of his people? He seems to. Even the, the most credible polling organizations, the Nevada Center, for example, uh, give him a very high approval ratings. And, and that's, I, I, I don't think it's that surprising because if, if you have been fed, as is the case with the Russian public, if you have been fed propaganda for a long time, uh, you will uh, believe your own authorities as opposed to uh, opposition news outlets or international news outlets. I, I think we all would in that situation. And, and it's essentially a, a case of having been fed poison for, for a long time. Uh, you you uh, lose the ability to um, to assess any any situation neutrally because you don't have the correct information. It is a tragedy, really, because uh, we know that, uh, for example, soldiers' mothers will want to speak up, but will they find will they find a, a, a willing audience when they start speaking up about having lost their sons in this war? Elizabeth, thank you so much for the insight. Elizabeth Braw, their resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller and Kay Lines in New York. Anna Edwards will be here in London. Investors rushing to the safety U.S. dollar. This is probably the biggest underpinning market move story of the day. So look out for levels on euro dollar. Also, global stocks sliding ever closer to a bear market. It's the Federal Reserve's aggressive tightening path, but also China's COVID lockdown worsening the outlook for the economic outlook. Now, I'm looking at a wave of risk aversion sweeping through global markets, and that is really leaving little room for a change, of course, in the Fed's rate increase and quantitative tightening plan. The FTSE down almost 1%, S&P futures down 1.3%. This is Bloomberg. It's the best of times and the worst of times. This is going to be a very tough environment. The market is really sensitive to headline OS, so we, we'll be watching very closely over the next week. These are incredible levels of all. We're holding our cash uh, with both hands, and uh, we still like holding a lot of cash. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Monday, May 9th. Our top stories today. 
The dollar's stronger against major peers as investors look for a haven. Stocks and oil fall. The group of seven pledges to ban Russian crude imports, but Saudi Arabia cuts prices. Vladimir Putin tries to justify his faltering invasion of Ukraine. He tells the annual Victory Day parade that Russian troops are fighting now as they did against Nazi Germany in World War II. And an historic election in Northern Ireland. The Nationalist Party Sinn Féin is the biggest party in the Assembly for the first time. What message does that send to Boris Johnson's government in London? Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta over in New York. Kayleigh Lyons is off today. And Kriti, a lot to think about when it comes to markets. A big focus on inflation as we go through the week. Uh, but no sign of risk appetite as we start the week here in Europe. Yeah, and, and that's pretty normal when you start to see a risk-off day on Friday. Remember, we're selling off quite a bit. And this is important because you're starting to see this reflect in different ways. When you look at the equity market around the world, you do see a risk-off picture. So the Asia-Pacific Index, MSCI Asia-Pacific Index, I should say, down 1.8%. A lot of those losses really focused in China. You're also seeing that story really translate over to Japan, down 2.5% as well. But, Anna, I think the dollar story is really worth highlighting here because, as you mentioned, inflation becomes the story, interest rate differentials becomes the story. And you, we know that that story has been pretty prominent in the Japanese yen. That weakness does continue. But take a look at the yuan as well. It did weaken against the dollar to pass the 6.7 level. And this is significant as we talk about China trying to stimulate more, trying to get more growth. Well, it hasn't really been able to do that because in the face of a hawkish Federal Reserve map, it just isn't that successful. So the question here is, do you start to see inflation and growth really start to butt heads with each other? Or do you start to see inflation become a more healthy signal of growth and right now that just doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, no, it definitely seems to be more the former than the latter, Critty. We have a couple of interesting superlatives in U.S. markets, starting with the dollar, which you mentioned. Um, but first, I want to take a look at what's going on in futures. It's not just risk off. We're off one and a third percent right now. So really falling hard in futures on this Monday as the VIX shoots up to 33. The last time we saw um, that happen, we lost a thousand points on the Dow. So be careful in in today's markets. The 10 year yield right now at 318. This is the highest we've seen since November of 2018. And the Bloomberg US dollar index at 1255, almost 1256. That's the highest we've seen since May of 2020. So we're seeing some uh, big moves in these numbers. Bitcoin falling down to 33,621. A lot of people have said, as I'm sure you've been talking about through the last week, um, 30,000 is the bottom of a range where people tend to buy. Uh, so we haven't seen it happen yet. And of course, we haven't gotten there yet, but we are seeing some serious losses in this very highly correlated asset. Anna, what do you see in terms of Europe? Yeah, Bitcoin and, uh, and futures then with momentum lower. And that lower momentum perhaps feeding through a little bit from what we see here in Europe then, Matt. Uh, we've got European equity markets really uh, on the back foot this morning, down by 1.2% on the CAC, on the Zetradax, down by nine-tenths of 1%. As we continue to be concerned about higher interest rate environment and whether stocks can withstand that, at the same time as digesting negative growth messaging, uh, in particular around China and the lockdowns there. With that in mind, let's have a look at how basic resource stocks are doing, because that's one area of weakness that we're really seeing here in the uh, European market, basic resources down by 3.8%. We've seen a tough environment for copper and for iron ore over recent sessions, and all of that adding to, up to a sector that's really under pressure in today's trade. Brent crude keeping the focus on commodities, and we're down by nine tenths of a percent there. So it's as if the China story is really impacting on commodities, even if it's the inflation and the higher interest rate environment that is a, a concern in other asset classes. The pound a little bit weaker this morning, down by six tenths of one percent. But this is also a story around the U.S. dollar and dollar strength, that move into the haven that the U.S. dollar oh so often represents at these times. But there's also some pound-specific risk in here to do with what's going on in Northern Ireland, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Leonardo, this is a supplier to the defence industry, and this is one area of, of brightness, of green, if you like, uh, an asset that people are buying this morning. That particular stock putting out earnings, they came in better than estimates, and the stock up by 2.5%. On the Russian side of things, of course, our focus on that Victory Day parade and the narrative that President Putin continues to build around what he is doing in Ukraine, even if he doesn't yet mention Ukraine by name, very much. The uh, the stock index down by half a percent or so. We've actually seen some weakness in the Russian ruble and some strength of the dollar. So the, the, uh, the strength that we're seeing in the dollar globally even impacting here on the ruble then, Chrissy. 
Yeah, and a lot to look for today. But let's look a look, get a look at what's ahead this week. Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi visits the White House tomorrow to discuss the Ukraine war and the global economy with President Biden. On Wednesday, we will have CPI data from China, Germany, and the United States, a very heavily watched report. And the UK GDP data released on Thursday. On Friday, we'll get CPI data from France and Spain, plus Euro area industrial production data as well. A very eco-heavy week. And we close out that week with a back-to-back G7 and NATO foreign minister meetings in Germany. Matt, there's a lot to digest here, but inflation seems to be at the center of yeah, it. Yeah, inflation definitely front and center. The dollar is showing further strength this morning as more investors look to the U.S. currency as a haven. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg Markets Live editor Eddie Vandervald. And Eddie, there's so much we could talk about with you today. Let's kick it off, though, with the greenback. Yeah, absolutely. The dollar is the story in markets at the moment. Uh, it's a, I, 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 I've, I've, I had a look at the chart, and it looks like we, for the Bloomberg Dollar Spot Index, we've only had six down days in the second quarter. You know, that's a, that's a phenomenal run, and it's putting pressure on asset assets across the board, whether you're looking at commodities, whether you're looking at emerging markets, you know, but it, it tells us something about risk, a uh, risk appetite, because the dollar is the ultimate haven, you know, in, in, in times when we see stress. So when we see these big red days, it's not a surprise that the dollar rises across across the board, really. Eddie, it seems that we're stressed perhaps about higher interest rates and that's having an impact and the fight against inflation. Also stressed about Chinese growth maybe and all of those things come together to give us actually a weaker oil price as if the, the, the oil price and oil markets are listening maybe to concerns around growth in China, yep. weaker pricing coming through from the Saudis. There's a lot competing but it's resulting in a weaker oil price today. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? And I think I think that the dollar will, that ha will have that sort of effect. It will start to put a lid on inflation a little bit. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it just shows where investors are, are, are moving away from. But as you say, the, 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 the oil price remains a big, big story at the moment. But what I also care a lot about is the differentia differential with, with, with things like diesel and jet fuel. Oh, the oil crack um, that they talk about, that's, that's just completely running away mm. with us. Yeah, so the, the crude prices we see are one thing, but the jet fuel, the diesel, Absolutely. and the gasoline prices rising even more. Eddie Van der Velt of Bloomberg Markets Live, thank you for the markets updates. Let's get back to the geopolitics. Russia's President Vladimir Putin tried to justify his faltering invasion of Ukraine as a battle comparable to the fight against Nazi Germany. Putin spoke at the annual Victory Day celebration in Red Square, marking the defeat of Germany in 1945. He said the conflict with Ukraine was inevitable. NATO countries didn't want to listen to us, and in fact, what happened, they had completely different plans, and we can see it today. And they openly prepared the operation in Donbass and the invasion of our historical lands, including Crimea. Let's get more with Maria Tadeo, uh, our European correspondent in Brussels. And of course, you know, he draws parallels. The big difference being in, in, with history, uh, Germany invaded Russia. Here we have Russia invading Ukraine. What did you take away from this address? Uh, yes, Anna, and uh, this parade every year, this is a huge deal for Russia. Of course, it celebrates this big moment, this big patriotic war, as they call it, uh, and this big victory over Nazi Germany from uh, the Soviet uh, Red Army. This year, of course, the context, uh, even more important and more relevant uh, in the context of this war in Ukraine. To me, what was interesting, however, Anna, it's not really what Vladimir Putin said, it's what he didn't say. If you look at the speech, which was very short, by the way, he did not mention Ukraine. Ukraine. He specifically talked about Donbass. He repeated that word Donbass for about eight uh, times. There was no reference to Mariupol either. There was no reference to the capital of Ukraine. He did not mention or even floated the idea of a full war, full mobilization against uh, Ukraine. And then, of course, he went back to say, ultimately, a lot of this was inevitable. The fight with Ukraine and the fight uh, with NATO were doing this to protect our country. Of course, if you look at what NATO says, they deny they ever intended on attacking Russia. Russia and they say this is a military alliance. But to me, perhaps in a very perverse way, the language and the speech from Vladimir Putin was actually softer than what many were expecting. Speaking of soft, uh, it looks like Germans think Schultz and the SPD have been a little bit too soft in their support of Ukraine. They were uh, absolutely destroyed in a regional election over the weekend. And now um, uh, the chancellor has come out defending his policy. 
Yeah, but uh, Matt, when you look at the opinion polls, but now also the voter reaction, this idea of we want to be tough on Russia, but at the same time cautious, we don't want to escalate, we don't want to send too many weapons uh, to Ukraine, and of course the German economy comes first. This approach halfway in between is really not paying off uh, for Olive Scholz. His approval rating has plummeted, his party did very bad in that election uh, yesterday, and if you look at also the tensions that this position from Germany is creating within the European Union, and you could argue at one point, does Germany really need to take a moment of self-introspection, perhaps, and figure out where they want to go uh, next from here, or actually continue this line, which is not really yielding anything from Olaf Scholz? A clearly very complex issue. Bloomer's Maria Tadeo in Brussels, thank you for breaking it down for us. Let's stick with that war in Ukraine. G7 leaders have pledged to ban the import of Russian oil in response to Putin's invasion. Meanwhile, the EU has struggled to agree on its own ban on Russian oil imports. Anne-Marie Hordern, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us now for more. As we just heard from Maria, there's a lot of complexity to this issue, and there have been some standouts, some of them turning over now and really joining that ban. Yeah, so as a whole, the G7 says they're looking to phase this out or outright ban oil, but there's no time frame. So this is really just an overarching aim for the group, and then every individual country is going to go about it their own way. So you already have the likes of the U.S. and the U.K. banning that. And then, of course, for Japan, they import a little bit of Russian oil, but it's still a big deal for them to come out and say this, and the prime minister said that himself, because of the fact that Japan has to import basically all of their energy needs. The issue is obviously going to come down to the European Union. You do have Germany, the biggest economy in the EU, backing this ban. They're the most that are really going to potentially be hurt from having this ban. But at the same time, you have the likes of Hungary uh, mm. that a meeting uh, yesterday really putting a spanner in the work saying they are not going to get on board with this. So you have the G7 as a whole saying this is what they aim to do, but the practicality of that and the details still not worked out. It's also kind of a womp womp, right? Because call me when there's a gas ban is the real right. news. Um, Pelosi here in the U.S., Nancy Pelosi says we have to pass a Ukraine aid package. How much are we talking about? How, uh, how easy is it going to be to get this through? Well, this is the $33 billion that the president requested because his drawdown authority for the money that Congress already has given the White House to use is um, starting to really evaporate. So there is bipartisan support to get this done. Members of Congress want to get this done. How it will get done is really the complicated question. So you have Speaker Pelosi, you have the White House saying that they want to marry this with COVID aid. But when COVID aid was on the brink of potentially passing, that was $10 billion for things like treatments, vaccines. You had the Republicans then wanting to expand Title 42, which was pandemic era uh, border, uh, border policy. So if they are going to marry these two, the Republicans are going to want an amendment or a force of vote of the Democrats on Title 42. So how this gets done is going to be uh, very difficult for the Democrats if they continue to maintain that they're going to marry them because the Republicans are certainly going to want to vote on Title 42. But when you just look at the Ukraine aid as a whole, they want to get this done, Republicans and Democrats. How it gets done, that's really going to be the question. Anne-Marie Hordern, thank you as always for bringing that to us. She joins us from Washington. And there's a direct read-through from what Anne-Marie was just talking about into stocks moving into pre-market trading. Let's dive into this here. Lockheed Martin is going to be a key example, working to double production capacity for its Javelin missiles to say 2,000 by year end. But CEO says the supply chain, well, it needs to, quote, crank up. And this is important because traditionally, when you start to see a war, for example, in Ukraine, naturally defense is going to be the clear outperformer. But what happens when those defense stocks aren't able to meet that capacity and really you are actually seeing well earlier in the session you were seeing some pain in Lockheed Martin after really rallying this kind of ramp up Lockheed Martin is literally being a defensive stock today uh, not seeing as much action so we'll of course keep an eye on that story as well can supply chain issues really keep up with that demand capacity let's talk about Tyson here Tyson reporting after the bell in the face of food inflation we know food prices are at the record high levels meat inflation a very key part of that but is Tyson able to actually make profits off of that inflation? Is it able to pass costs on to consumer? That's going to be a key earnings report after the bell. And let's take a look at that tech trade. Apple as a proxy of that tech trade, seeing the most volume in pre-market trading this morning. Totally normal given that it's the biggest uh, weight in the S&P 500. But as we talk about higher rates, inflation, growth, tech kind of em embolizes that exact problem. And Anna, that's really where you're seeing a lot of pain. The question is, if tech can't actually rise above it, if tech can't actually actually develop sort of the sort of resistance mm. trade to higher yields can the rest of the market. 
Right, and where do those higher yields go is certainly going to be one of our topics of conversation next. We'll be talking to Pooja Kumra, Senior European Rate Strategist at TD Securities. We'll ask her about that higher rates environment. And more on geopolitics, Judy Dempsey joins us, non-resident senior fellow at Carnegie Europe. We will get thoughts on Ukraine, also Ireland in focus. Plus, HSBC under attack, how the bank's biggest shareholder is now looking to break up the company 20 years after putting it on the map. You can read more about that in today. Today's Big Take story by typing NI Big Take. That's on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We are simulcast on radio and television. I'm Matt Miller here with Kriti Gupta in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Kaylee Lines is off today. Now, the Irish Nationalist Party, Sinn Féin, is the biggest group in Northern Ireland's assembly for the first time. The historic election result over the weekend marks a significant shift in the region's balance of power and sends a strong message to Boris Johnson's government in London. Let's get more with Morwenna Conium, our Dublin Bureau Chief. Morena, great to have you on the program. Thanks for joining us. My first thought was, does this mean Northern Ireland is going to get back together with the Republic of Ireland, especially since a pro-EU party also won a lot of votes and that would bring them into the fold, right? Well, it does certainly make the question asked again. However, it's really important to remember that um, the Democratic Union as party uh, came in second. They would be strongly opposed to that. And overall, unionist parties actually got more votes than nationalist parties. It also, there can only be a border poll if it's called by the UK government. And then only if it's likely to pass. And the most recent polling showed only 32% of people in Northern Ireland would actually vote for a United Ireland today. Okay, so that's really important, interesting background, Moena. Where does this leave us on the Northern Ireland Protocol? This much talked about, really controversial part of the Brexit deal. It is, it is an unhappiness with the protocol as it exists right now that means that the DUP is saying that they might refuse to, to participate in the Northern Ireland Assembly executive at this point. Where does this leave that, uh, that protocol? Well, it is certainly um, a real point of contention at the moment. Um, the UK government and the uh, De Democratic Unionist Party have been calling for it to, to be um, rewritten or, or scrapped. Um, and the DUP, as you say, have been saying that as a condition to them entering the power sharing executive. Um, UK uh, Northern Ireland Secretary uh, Brandon Lewis I is meeting with party leaders uh, today to try and um, get them to form an e executive and um, you know Sinn Féin uh, and the Alliance Party and others do really want to form that executive but it is a sticking point we're waiting to see what the UK is going to say on that and indeed Jeffrey Donaldson the leader of the DUP has said he is waiting to see what the UK's response is on the protocol. It turns out more one of there are a lot of people a lot of voters in Northern Ireland who aren't unionists or Republicans right um, what do we know about this, uh, like, emerging um, group of people in the middle? Well, yeah, that's been a very interesting development in this election. I mean, there have been a, a big number of people who identify as neither unionist nor nationalist for quite some time, but we haven't really seen that come through in the polls in an assembly election before. Um, you know, they, they got uh, 17 seats up from eight in 2017 so it really was a significant victory for them and it does raise the question um, you know of the uh, constitutional arrangements at the moment which do favor you know unionist or nationalist parties and it shows that a lot of people are voting for other issues you know people are concerned about the economy they're concerned about the cost of living they, they want health care to be um, improved mm. and um, you know a lot of those people aren't interested in the constitutional issues anymore yeah. Yeah, the Cross Community Alliance Party then attracting a lot of attention for those reasons. Moena, thank you very much for the update. Moena Conium from uh, Dublin, our Dublin Bureau Chief, in fact, with the latest on that story. We'll have more on Northern Ireland coming up with Judy Dempsey, non-resident senior fellow at Carnegie Europe. That conversation shortly. This is Bloomberg.
Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. In China, exports and imports struggled last month. Coronavirus outbreaks cut demand, undermined production, and disrupted logistics. Export growth fell to the lowest in almost two years. Imports were unchanged, but would have been weaker without rising commodity prices. In Hong Kong, incoming leader John Lee has promised to bolster national security and accelerate integration with mainland China. The former security minister is preparing to take power after a near unanimous election by a Beijing controlled committee. Lee helped outgoing chief executive Carrie Lam crack down on democracy protests three years ago. And it's ending as fast as it began for retail day traders. Amateur investors who jumped in when the lockdown began have now given back all of their once prodigious gains, assuming they haven't already sold. That's according to an estimate by Morgan Stanley. Higher interest rates have led to a bear market in speculative stocks that surged when the stimulus started flowing in 2020. Coming up, Pooja Kumra, TD's senior European rate strategist. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. The dollar's stronger against major peers as investors look for a haven. Stocks and oil fall. The group of seven pledges to ban Russian crude imports, but Saudi Arabia cuts prices on weaker demand in China. Russia's President Vladimir Putin tried to justify his faltering invasion of Ukraine as a battle comparable to the fight against Nazi Germany. Putin spoke at the annual Victory Day celebration in Red Square, marking the defeat of Germany in 1945. And an historic election in Northern Ireland. The Nationalist Party Sinn Féin is the biggest party in the Assembly for the first time. That sends a strong message to Boris Johnson's government in London. Sinn Féin's ultimate goal is to unite Northern Ireland with the neighbouring Republic of Ireland. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta over in New York. Kayleigh Lines is off today. And Matt, not much risk appetite really for European equity markets retreating today following tough losses on Wall Street and here in Europe on Friday. A, a sort of gloom has fallen across stocks. Yeah, although I'm so pumped to be back at work after <laughs> suffering from a legit coronavirus for the past couple of weeks that... I can't not be in a good mood, even though we're looking at futures that are down now one and a half percent. I mean, what a rough way to kick off a Monday if you're long uh, stocks. We see real gains in the dollar, the Bloomberg dollar index now up to 318 right now. That's the highest level we've seen since I think November of 2018. Uh, sorry, uh, the Bloomberg dollar index index up to 1255, uh, the highest level we've seen since November of 2018. I haven't forgotten that this is actually the 10-year yield. 318, uh, the gain there, um, the biggest that we've seen in a while as well. A couple of years um, since we've seen the 10-year the yield up that high. So it's very much um, risk off today. You can see that in Bitcoin as well, down more than 2%, 33,518. Nonetheless, I'm pretty chill. I'm pretty chill, even though, Critty, we see these big losses already. Um, some big losses, but you know what's interesting is where you are seeing perhaps some good news. We'll get to that in a second, but there is the story that we have to keep an eye on, a defensive trade that has actually been working for the market for a while now, and that, of course, is Lockheed Martin when it comes to pre-market movers, working to double production capacity for its Javelin missiles. We know, of course, some of those going to Ukraine, but its CEO says the supply chain needs to, quote, crank up to meet that capacity. Now, we did see it down as much as six-tenths of one percent earlier in the session, and one of these questions is, yes, there's a lot of demand. So fundamentally, the stock should be higher. But even though we're not seeing that, you really see those supply chain issues feeding in to that bottom line. The other one we want to keep an eye on, though, is Tyson. This is where the good news is, Matt. Tyson reporting after the bell in the face of food inflation. Now, this is important as we talk about food prices at the highest on record. How much of those profits can Tyson actually see? They're going to report after the bell today, and we are going to find out. And lastly, Apple. I'm going to use this as a proxy for the broader tech trade, seeing the most volume in pre-market trading this morning. Totally normal given just the weighting it has in the S&P 500. But as we talk about higher rates and the growth outlook and a stronger dollar, by the way, that's going to make it more expensive for that foreign bid to come into the broader index, but into tech names in particular. Can Apple weather the storm? We'll have to see as it perhaps carries the entire index with it, Anna.
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, higher rates taking the edge off tech, higher rates and concerns about higher rates taking the edge off Europe today. European stocks down by 1.3%. The Brent crude price is interesting, down by 1.5%. In the early part of the European trading day, we were actually, or in, through the Asia session, I should say, we were actually fluctuating quite a bit on the oil price. Competing news flow coming in here. So the G7, yes, banning imports, intending to ban imports from Russia. But on the other hand, we had the Saudis cutting their prices because of weakness in China and cutting their prices to the Chinese market in particular. So uh, the Brent price settling a little lower, down by 1.5%. The pound also under pressure. This is really a strong dollar story, of course, but there is a little bit of uh, Northern Ireland protocol risk in there, shall we say, 122.82. And interesting, in the context of what Critty was saying there about the uh, about uh, defence names over in the United States and where the issues are there, uh, Leonardo is a, an Italian-listed business that supplies the defence industry, and that stock actually up by more than 2% today on the back of earnings that came in better than anticipated. Quick check on Russian assets for you and we do see that the strength of the, of the US dollar coming through in the weakness in the ruble in today's trade. Of course, today the focus on the geopolitics, what was said and what was not said by President Putin at that, uh, at that address in Red Square. Later on in the week, we'll focus on inflation because we'll have Russian data on that front. Chrissy? Yeah, Anna, I think out of all the market checks that we just did, it's got to be the dollar that continues to be the story. I and mean, we're talking about inflation. We're talking about this rate story growth, of course. But this is really important when we talk about simply just how strong the dollar is and the move that it's having for the rest of the market. It's not just a currency story. It's a commodity story as well. It makes it harder to buy those commodity contracts that are priced in dollars. Oil, copper, for example. Joining us now, let's really dig into it. Pooja Kumra, senior European race strategist at TD. Pooja, thank you as always for joining us. The stronger dollar story. Let's start there. A lot of strategists, the MLife survey, for example, forecasting that euro dollar parity is just on the horizon. Your take. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, definitely, it's strong dollar story, something that's ongoing, and there's nothing going against it so far, just because we know that Fed is pretty much above the other central banks when it comes to tightening policy. And I think in Europe, we also need to discount a part of the growth impact that could happen as we do are more, we are more closely related to Russia, and I think that's where you would see Euro, as well as Yen, everything's just pointing to one way, which is basically suggesting a strong dollar. Mm, so strong dollar is the, is the theme. Pooja, good morning. Good. Uh, good to see you here in London. Strong dollar is the theme, and part of that being driven then by, well, it's the haven trade, but there's also the rates differentials. 3.18 is where we are on the US 10-year yield right now. I, I think you've talked in the past about 3.2% by year end, which isn't all that far from where we are. So is this something of a moving target at this point? Uh, we are based, I mean, we do expect the rates to actually move even higher. I think just given the fact that Fed has told us that they will be implementing a couple of 50 basis points hikes. But I think when it comes to year end, we are looking for some consolidation. That's where we do stick to our 3.2% in terms of where we see 10 year treasuries ending 2022. Okay, so, so, so rates could get higher in the short term, but in maybe short. some room yes. to come back down. Where does that leave corporate debt and risks attached to corporate debt? I was looking at European uh, corporates today and the CDS, the cost of insuring against default, increasing, and this is for high yield, but also the safer uh, businesses in Europe. And they're now at levels that we haven't seen since spring of 2020. Is this something that gives you reason to be concerned on the corporate side? No, definitely. I think now we are more getting more concerned about other risky assets. So far, the sell-off in rates was definitely front-end, treasuries, because markets were pricing higher rates. But now what we are seeing post-Fed, like since last week, real yields have actually increased by 20 basis points. And higher yield yields basically is, has its impact on all risk assets. And I think that's where you markets will start questioning whether these assets are worth the price that they are paying for, whether they are ready to take the risk. And I think that's where you could get bid back to treasuries here. Mm. I can imagine, you know, 318 being a, an attractive rate for someone who uh, wants income. On the other hand, you've got rate increases coming. That's fairly clear. And you've got the lack of liquidity as a central bank, um, you know, stops buying these assets. Is that a bigger problem? 
Definitely liquidity is an issue and QT is something that market, even though it was very well flagged, it's finally coming into play and it's not going to be just for Fed but it's also going to be for BOE and at some point even ECB. And I think that's where markets have to assess who will be the marginal buyer of these uh, bonds. Like so far we are seeing outflows from money market funds, we are seeing outflows from banks, we are seeing outflows from foreign investors. So I think that's where is a crucial point. At what stage markets will start reassessing the levels for treasuries and actually reassessing re whether their portfolios need more risk assets, which are stocks, IG credit, high yields, versus treasuries again. So is the are the rate increases, Pooja, and the uh, quantitative tightening priced in, or are the markets just not sure if they believe central banks are going to go as far as they're projecting? I think with respect to rate hikes, they are very well priced and I think markets are pretty much more hawkishly priced than what is being told to us even by central banks. And I think for example, we can definitely see from the case of BOE, which had a very dovish turn last week, but still markets are pricing around 120 basis points in hikes. So we are overpriced with respect to hikes. So that kind of limits it. But I think where we could see the repricing coming in is basically via steeper curves as your real yield start increasing markets start reassessing the outlook for other risk assets. So I think that's where it will be the next move in terms of rates and curves, which is steeper curves. Mm, and you wonder then what that does to stocks. Stocks are under pressure today down by 1.3% on the stock 600. Thank you very much, Pooja, for joining us. Pooja Kumra, Senior European Rates Strategist at Toronto Dominion Bank, joining us here on set in London. Now, the Russian President Vladimir Putin says that Russian troops in Ukraine are fighting to ensure there wouldn't be a repeat of a global conflict like the Second World War. He's spoke at the, Nash, uh, the nation's annual Victory Day parade. Joining us now is Judy Dempsey, non-resident senior fellow at Carnegie Europe. Uh, Judy, he, he likes to make this comparison between what Russia is doing now and what, uh, and what Russia did during World War II. Of course, from a Western perspective, these things are, are, are not comparable because of who invaded whom, I suppose. But what did you take away from this speech that we got from uh, President Putin? Either what was in it or what was not? Well, um, what, thank you for having me on the show. What wasn't in it was any mention of a general mobilization of the Russian armed forces. There was no mention, I don't think it would be appropriate in any case, to continue to try to overthrow President Zelensky of Ukraine. And generally, it was a speech looking back. Uh, there was very little bravado. Um, and it, one, if reading between the lines, there certainly was a kind of anticlimax that, that this was not the victory speech that Putin had anticipated way back in February when he invaded Ukraine for the second time. Judy, I, I want to ask you more about Germany than, than Russia because the SPD, um, Schultz's party, got crushed in regional elections over the weekend, mainly because it seems the party is so wishy-washy on its stance in support of Ukraine. They're agreeing to send weapons, but they don't want to obviously cut off gas imports. Um, is there any possibility that changes? Even the Greens beat the SPD in these elections. This is an astonishing victory for the CDU. And I mean, they took up 43% of the vote. I mean, this is historic and a historic low for the Social Democrats. Um, great victory for the Greens who are now ahead of the Social Democrats. I think you're right, Matt. There's huge disappointment with uh, Chancellor Schulz. Uh, the public really don't know where, the, where they stand with when it comes to the policy on Ukraine, even on Russia, even though Schulz tries to say, well, Russia mustn't win this war. This is the first thing. And secondly, we must remember that sometimes these state elections are local uh, and, and regional. Right. And uh, the SPD candidate was so unknown. The incumbent, uh, Gutner, was so liked. He ran a very good campaign, and so did the Greens. But essentially, the Social Democrats just didn't get their act together. Well, but the fact that they did so badly does have repercussions for the federal level of the of the Social Democratic leadership. Well, well, well they essentially, I mean, Schultz saying, we're going to keep sending tanks to Ukraine, but we're going to continue wiring billions and billions of dollars to Moscow um, to finance this effort. Uh, of course, that's not why they're sending them the money. They're, they're buying gas. Is the CDU going to offer anything different, Judy? Certainly the CDU is not in a position to offer anything differently, but is it, it is in a position to embarrass uh, the coalition. This is the first thing. And the leader of the, the Christian Democrats, 
Friedrich Merz, he went off to Kiev, having really upstaged the president of Germany and the chancellor. And it's been back and forth whether they should visit Kiev. It is quite astonishing, actually, when you look at this country. Uh, the foreign minister hasn't been to Kiev. The chancellor hasn't been to Kiev. The president hasn't been to Kiev. The economics minister hasn't been to Kiev. The only high-level person that has been to Kiev, and she did a very good job yesterday, was the president of, of the Bundestag, the German parliament. This is quite astonishing. Astonishing, actually, Kiev is literally around the corner over Poland. Judy, I'd like to draw on your knowledge and your experience in covering NATO in particular. What can NATO do with just shy of putting boots on the ground when it comes to the Russian Ukraine war? We, of course, know the G7 now targeting a Russian oil ban, but how much farther can they go? How many tools are left in the box? I think there's quite a lot of tools still left in the box. Uh, don't forget there's a summit coming up in Madrid in a few weeks' time. And Finland and Sweden, who are neutral countries, they are now really considering uh, joining NATO. The public mood in Sweden and Finland has absolutely radically shifted towards joining the alliance. This is going to be a major boost to the alliance. It's going to be a major embarrassment um, and a setback to Russia, who's criticised NATO from every possible angle. Um, so the fact that NATO becomes stronger uh, out of this war is, is actually very, very interesting for the alliance. This is the first thing. Secondly, is that um, you mentioned the tools. The tools is the, the role of the United States, how it's galvanizing the European members of NATO, mm. how it's out there uh, giving intelligence and logistics and other uh, military material to the Ukrainians. They've actually kept the, the backbone of, of the Europeans rather hard on this, which is actually quite okay. important. Judy, just before we let you go, I wanted to get your thoughts on, on, on what's going on in Northern Ireland, as, it, as with your, uh, with your um, studies of, of, of broad European politics, I'd be interested to get your take. Mm -hmm. uh, Sinn Féin, the largest party in the Northern Ireland Assembly now, the rise of the Cross Community Alliance Party. What context do, do you add to, to what we're seeing, quite historic moves in Northern Ireland? It, this is very, very important. It can't be underestimated. Sinn Féin will buy its time. It won the election, first time ever to become the largest party in Northern Ireland on the basis of, of small issues, employment, how, unemployment, housing, making li people's lives better. But the long-term agenda is United Ireland. It's too early to do this. It's going to require confidence-building measures. It's going to require a referendum as well. But watch out. Thanks very much, Judy. Good to speak to you. Judy Dempsey of Carnegie Europe, thank you for joining us. Coming up, how Miami is using crypto to position itself towards the top of the global financial system. More context on that one next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at a shot of the principal room. Coming up later today, an exclusive interview with Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic. That's at 8 a.m. in New York, 1 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. I think for us, crypto was uh, the slingshot in the David and Goliath story, right? If, if, if we are uh, competing with someone who is bigger and stronger, uh, we have to be smarter. Uh, so that was our hack on how we were going to become prominent in a increasingly technological world and ecosystem. Miami Mayor Francis Suarez there discussing the city's crypto ambitions as the Bloomberg Power Players Summit gathers on uh, uh, or gathered on uh, Friday. Meanwhile, Bitcoin continued to follow the negative trend in equity markets. The world's largest digital token is falling towards levels last seen in 2021 in July of 2021, trading um, just below $33,000, just above, uh, just below 34, above 33,000, I should say. It's part of a wider retreat in cryptocurrencies as investors get out of riskier assets. For more on this, tune in to Bloomberg Crypto tomorrow at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. London. This week, we'll hear from Bitwise CIO Matt Hoogan and venture capitalist Elise Killeen of Stillmark. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kriti Gupta in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, the original, joins us now with his single best chart. Tom, what have you got to kick off the week? We're going to put in perspective. The news flow, Matt, this morning is absolutely extraordinary. I want to talk to you about the German elections sometime this morning. I think they've been beneath the American at radar. Very important. But what we're going to do is get perspective on the market. This is the enclaimed Ibbotson chart. Roger Ibbotson, I use a Dow here just to harass John Farrow. But off the Guadalcanal low of 1942, up, up we go with the great success of American capitalism. And we need a sense of where you are, to borrow from the great John McPhee. And the answer is we've been above the long-term trend nicely since 2012. Yes, we've come back a little bit, but it has been a true bull market. A fascinating chart, and on the Dow, no less. Uh, Tom, you've got quite the lineup <clears throat> this morning. Who are you interviewing? Well, we're going to talk about the markets. The Jan Hatzius note over the weekend on inflation was the first bright shining star, uh, uh, Critty, that I've seen of optimism here, where he says flat out inflation is coming down. We'll drive that forward with a lot of market participants, Eric Friedman, to start as strong. And then Michael McKee with a conversation with a gentleman from the Atlanta Fed, Raphael Bostic. And we will speak to the White House, the Deputy Secretary of Treasury, about uh, the financial moment. Wally is, Adam will join us as well. Tom, is the John McPhee reference, is that a Fleetwood Mac reference? No, that's not a John. Oh, my word. No. <laughs> this is the guy. It is not a Fleetwood Mac reference, although I can understand that you would do that with the giant uh, a bass player of the Mac uh, McPhee. Uh, John McPhee uh, reinvented nonfiction about 40 years ago. Matt, I can see you reading his classic book about the birch bark canoe. I, I can see Matt in a birch bark canoe. I will look back. I'm a big fan of birch, for <clears> sure. <throat> Tom Keen, thanks so much for joining us. Tom Keen, co anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, talking to us about what's on the program. Critty, what else are we watching today? Well, I'm watching Tyson earnings, which I know isn't that perhaps exciting on the macro front, but as we talk about food inflation, food at the highest record levels, I think going back to data, data that we really have, Tyson reporting after the bell, can they actually make profit out of it, or are they dealing with the same wage and supply chain issues that everyone else is dealing with? Have that? you seen Baraka, by the way, the movie Baraka from the early 90s? No, and every time I'm on with you, it's some movie reference right. that I just don't know. I'm just <laughs> saying, if you're going to be eating food from Tyson, if you're going to be eating chicken that's grown in factories, you've got to see that movie, uh, Baraka. I'm watching the euro, U.S. dollar rate. Um, in the view of 60 percent of respondents to the latest MLive Pulse survey, the euro is more likely to hit parity with the dollar than it is to hit 110. Um, I'm not sure. I remember uh, listening to Anna Edwards this morning on radio. She said it was 105.10, so we must be right around there somewhere. Yes, 105.23 mm -hmm. as I look left to my data check. That is right. Uh, Anna, we're, we're almost there. And as I prepare for a trip to Spain, I root for the greenback. <laughs> You root for the greenback. And don't worry, Critty, it's not compulsory to get all of Matt's cultural references. There are so many. You can't there keep are up. A lot. Uh, I'm watching I'm watching I'm watching inflation and this is, you know, this links in with what Matt was saying about the Euro dollar and whether we get to parity, maybe. Uh, I'm watching inflation because yes, we've got US inflation. Will we see that come back down from the recent highs this week? But we also have inflation out from a whole load of other places this week. China, Germany, France, Mexico, Indonesia, and Russia, of course. Interesting to see what impact the sanctions package is having there. So we will continue to to monitor the global inflation story as it weighs on the decisions made by global central banks. A different narrative, of course, out of China. We just heard from the PBOC uh, and how they don't plan to flood the economy with stimulus. Lots to discuss then as we monitor those uh, inflation numbers as they hit this week. That is it for the early edition. Surveillance is up next with Tom, John and Lisa. This is Bloomberg.